I'm going to tell you the story uh, of this piece of artwork, the cartoon periodic chart. I think it, it looks pretty simple, but it's not just one poster, it's 118 posters hopefully working in harmony with each other. So I'm going to, I'm going to do like a quick five minute bio of my life. I mean, I know there's a lot of people in here who know me, but uh, maybe that you maybe don't know anything about me. So I'm just going to do like a quick introduction. And then I'm going to dovetail that with the 28-year adventure, which was this single poster. And Paul, I was really encouraged that you talked about working on a project for more than 20 years. So I appreciate the brotherhood that I feel with you. Yes, but, uh, yes, but yours got finished. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, but I got, I got eight years on you. Just so you know, my name is Zach Zish. I grew up here in St. Louis in Webster Groves, directly next door to Webster University which is a great place to grow up. We're right next to the Loretta Hilton Theater. I've always liked art. This is my very first art competition at the Webster Groves YMCA. Uh, I thought I would horribly embarrass myself by showing this. I ended up going to Wash U. This is the eye style that I worked in while I was in college. I just wanted to show an example of that. If, if you go to Wash U, like the big competition, that's it. That's it, yeah. Uh, if, if you go to Wash U, the big competition is to see if you can get one of your pieces picked by the hammer mill paper competition. So luckily, uh, I was chosen for December of 1987. And uh, this is a big deal because it got distributed around the country. So I graduated in 87. These are my two roommates from that time. I'd say probably the luckiest thing I ever did in college was choose to move in with these two guys. This is Keith Anderson. And this is Steve Edwards, and they were both the valedictorians of our class, but they were also like unbelievably talented artists. Uh, Keith just got uh, a job as the creative director at DDB Needham in New York, and uh, I've kind of fallen out of touch with Steve a little bit, but he was a major factor in influencing my life. Because when we uh, lived in an apartment together, he was getting job offers, I'd say about three or four a day. And uh, he was very busy. He was working for C.C. Bartels and all sorts of other opportunities, too. And one day he said, hey, listen, I got this call uh, from this agency, and I don't, I don't have time to go down there and show my portfolio. Do you want to go? <laughs> and uh, that agency was TBWA. And I went down and interviewed for that job, and I, that was my first job out of college. And I would totally have not have gotten that if Steve hadn't been kind enough to, uh, to ask me to go in his stead. So I started down there as a production artist in 87 doing paste up, uh, working on a drafting table. At around the same time, my two friends from Wash U, Ellie Murphy and Heidi Appel, told me that they were planning a trip to Europe and they wanted uh, a man to come along with them and they asked me if I was interested. And I was like, are you kidding? <laughs> I'm very interested. Uh, but I was like, how, how would you like pay for something like that? Uh, like I was at my first job out of college, I think it, they were paying me just slightly more than minimum wage and there was like no way I was gonna make enough money to take any kind of uh, trip. And my friend Ellie said, well, think about what I'm doing. Uh, I'm working as a legal secretary during the day. I'm waitressing uh, on the weekends, and I'm teaching swimming lessons on the weekends. I've got three jobs. And I thought, that is brilliant. That is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there's only 24 hours in the day. That's, <laughs> that's OK. So the next day, I was over at the Lewis Center by Wash U, and I saw this ad that uh, Drussels was looking for a cook. I don't have any pictures from that, but I, I do have pictures from another cooking job that I was at. So, uh, so I, I, I applied for that job immediately, and so I was working at TBWA Monday through Friday, and I was working at Drussels on Saturdays and Sundays. And I took uh, all the money from the restaurant job, and I slowly, you know, every week put it into a fund, and at the end of the two years, I had $5,000, which I was trying to think about how much money that would be today. I think that would be about $15,000 today. Because yeah. uh, this is in 88. This is back in 88. Yeah. So at, uh, at the end of that, you know, it was about 18 months. We went on this just amazing journey, starting in Israel and going to Egypt and Greece, Yugoslavia, Spain, France, and you know, every country in between. So it was just really a remarkable uh, adventure. And I thank Heidi and Ellie for it every time I think about it. And when I got back, I got my old job back. I went from making like four twenty-five an hour to making ten dollars an hour, and uh, eventually I got to work on the Absu Vodka account. And uh, even though I submitted about thirty ideas, this, this is the one that got chosen. It was about five years since I got out of college. 
All my friends starting to go to graduate school, they were already in graduate school. I wasn't like completely thrilled with advertising, so I thought the one thing that has held the most fascination for me has always been animation. And my dream since I first found out about it was to go to Cal Arts. So in 91 I applied and I was accepted. I went out there in 92 and it was one of the most euphoric experiences of my life. I mean, I always loved the animation, but if you're in St. Louis, there's, there's not a lot to do in animation. There just aren't very many options. And out there, everybody was like an animation and comic book freak. And you know, I just like, it was like the most comfortable living environment ever. And it was great to be around passionate people who love the art form that you love. I learned basic filmmaking and I learned the fundamentals of animation. And I got to study animation with this guy, Jules Engel, who in the animation community is well known, but uh, I think anybody would know the characters that he helped develop, which was uh, Mr. Magoo and Gerald McBoing Boing. So it was a, a great experience for me. I was out there during the Northridge earthquake, January of 94, of the school. It was like temporarily condemned, so we were in school technically, but we didn't have a facility to go to. <laughs> So uh, it was about a month of not doing anything and then a month of moving to a different facility and the school was asking people for money to help with the repairs and Steven Spielberg and Jeffrey Katzenberg came out to the campus and I knew that they were going to be on campus that day but I was like sure that I was not going to see them because I had like the studio which was at the far end of the building. And that day they came, I could see Steven Spielberg like a mile away. I'm like, oh my God, check it out. That's Steven Spielberg. But I was like, he's a mile away, so I'll never get to meet him. And so I was cleaning up my studio, and I look up, and Steven Spielberg is standing right next to me, and he's reading my storyboard to me. So and this is a picture of the storyboard on, on the right. So he's telling me, frame by frame, what's going on in my storyboard. It was one of the most euphoric moments of my life. I felt complete joy for like a, a week after that. So it was a really great experience. What was the storyboard? What was it? Oh, what, what, what film was it? Okay, so this is a movie I never made or so far, but it was uh, about like a shaman on Easter Island who puts his soul into the, the statues and they come alive and there's a, a dynamic in between the, the statues that we're all familiar with and some other kind of God imagery that was popular after the belief in those stones fell out of favor. Isn't that what your phone's about? <laughs> <laughs> I know there's some cowboys in it too. It's got everything. So that, that was a good time. I was, I was coming up on some bad times though. I, right after that I found out my dad was terminally ill. And so I dropped out of school. And my sister, who was also in grad school, dropped out of school. And we both moved back to St. Louis and we cared for our dad for the last year of his life. And uh, during that time, I, I, you know, actually, I remember you, were, you and Mark Buckley were very helpful to me at that time because I was trying to figure out how I was going to work and how I was going to take care of my dad. And at first, I, I was applying for a regular full time job at Osborne and Bar. And Mark, when I told him the situation, he said that you, you and him would uh, help, help get me some freelance as I needed it. And th that, was, that was really a big help at a very difficult time. These are some of the companies I freelanced at during that time. And uh, I did that for about seven years. And, and after seven years, I, I, I was finding it's a very lonely existence. You're, like, you're, you're at one agency <coughs> one week and you're at another agency the next week. You don't really get to meet people. And so when I got offered the job at Merrimack Community College in 2002, I was like, thank God. You know, like I, I like going to the place and I like working with people like Tony Caracella whose work I admire and whose friendship I cherish. So uh, that was, that was a, a meaningful development in my career. Okay, so that's the story of my life. Uh, I'd like to switch gears a little bit now and talk about this project that I've been working on. What do you teach there? So like I teach in the College for Kids program or teach in their, their high school program and I teach in their workshops program and I teach in the continuing ed department. And I also, you know, uh, work the front desk there in the computer lab. So I've got about five different part-time jobs. Which I'm just going to talk a little bit about my philosophy of art. <laughs> and this says design won't save the world. And I really vehemently disagree with that. I think if, if anything's going to help save the world, I mean, it's not going to do it on its own. But as artists, we should think big. You know, and I admit I have, you know, slightly grandiose ideas about what art can do. But it keeps me excited. So I, I, I don't see a bad side to that. Also, I'm very strongly influenced by this particular book by Buckminster Fuller. Uh, he, I think he has a lot of great quotes from this, but one was, 
He said, we're not going to make it in, unless we can increase scientific literacy. And I, I would have read that back in like 81 or 82, so it's something that stayed with me for a long time. Here are like what I consider to be the big overarching problems uh, that confront mankind. And I think, is there any one of these that I could you know, maybe just make a small contribution towards helping with? So that's, that's part of where, where the idea for the periodic chart came from, is trying to think, you know, as an artist, what could I possibly do to help make you know, people more aware of science. Artists have a lot of skills, you know, make something that might seem mundane more exciting. I'm going to go back to when this project first started, 1984, and uh, this, this is what I looked like, and I, I just had the most fabulous girlfriend that semester, and she was a huge influence on me. I, I think we were maybe the most different people who ever dated in the history of dating. She had bicycled across the country, like she had started in New York and bicycled to California, which is inconceivable to me. She was fluent in English and French. She grew up in Scarsdale, New York, but she had family in, in Europe, so she would go to Europe every year. So all these things about her were just like inconceivable to me. And she was also maybe like the fastest learner I ever met. And you know, I'm like, I consider myself like one of the slowest learners. So the whole time we were dating, I was like, you know, wh wh what, what can I do to try to impress this girl, you know? And so, and she didn't seem to like anything superficial. I mean, she what she did she never watched TV. Everything had a purpose in her life. So, like I said, I was always thinking, you know, how can I try to impress this girl? One day I saw her doing a crossword puzzle, which like really surprised me. Like she's like, yeah, come over here and help me with this. And uh, I was like, I, I'm not good at cross. I, I'm not going to be able to help you with that. She was like looking at a games magazine and had all these visual puzzles. I think she was trying to just make me feel better. You know, I'd solve the visual puzzle and she'd solve the word puzzles. But at that moment, I thought, aha! I, and she's pre-med, so she's into science, and she likes games, she likes crossword puzzles. So I thought, I'm gonna do something that's gonna take my world of art and it's gonna bridge it with the world of science. So that was the idea. However, I had, I had absolutely no idea how I was gonna do that. I just had, I just had the desire to try to do something with science that involved art, but what path that was gonna take, I had no idea. You didn't offer to just take her to dinner. <laughs> so that was that was my sophomore year. The next year, I decided, well, I gotta like study up on science. So I, I took like the basic biology 101 class at, at Wash U. And uh, at the end of the class, I was like, you know what's wrong with this class is they have really crappy graphics. I mean, if you look at a textbook, I mean, the drawings are just you're, there's obviously no passion in that work at all. And I I don't blame. I, I would imagine like those guys don't make any money or you know they have super tight deadlines where they can't really put any of themselves into the work. So I took that class, I, I decided for myself the problem was that the graphics sucked, and I, for my last semester project at Wash U, I thought I'm going to do like a cartoon biology textbook. And it was actually a more grandiose idea than that. I was like, I'm going to explain all of science in drawings. Yes. Yes. I'm going to explain all of science in drawings. Now, uh, I don't know exactly how I thought I was going to do this since I didn't really understand science that well, but, but I thought I, 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 I did about 50 pages in this kind of very rough uh, cartoon uh, language, but... Uh, That's awesome! That's awesome. Yeah. Get over here. Okay, but it, there were some things as I was scanning this last night, like ions are radioactive, and there's these two ions with boot boxes. I thought, wow! <laughs> this one is called Moses and Osmosis, and it's Moses going through the semi-permeal membrane. <laughs> right, this one I got to kick out. This uh, water molecule, and he says, I'm tired of being a good and pure water molecule. I want to find out what goes on beyond the semi-permeable membrane, you know. <laughs> Did you show this to anybody? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I showed it to my review committee at Wash U and, uh, what about the science no. department? You know what, I, I hate to say this, but any time I've ever shown any of this type of work to scientists, they, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't go on their radar screen. I always wonder, why am I striking out so bad with the scientists? And I think it's because they, they don't have a problem learning scientists. It's, their mind works like that. But this is designed for 
people who don't have an affinity for it to invite them in and say, hey, come on, this is pretty interesting. I mean, I don't mean to exclude anybody, but I just don't think they don't, they don't see a need for it. And I, I feel like, oh, come on, the, the need is, you know. Like a whole new building. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there were there were other images, you know, not not just pages. So this is the atomic number drawing I did. And this is the atomic scale or the atomic weight. You know, this is the uh, the nucleus. So there's your neutrons and your protons hanging out together, and then there are the electrons in the outer shell. And then I started to uh, talk about the different kind of bonds, the ionic bond. I, I started to get excited about uh, adding the different elements together. So I, I did the nucleic acids. So these are the four nucleic acids. At, at about this time, I you know graduated from WashU. So I'm thankful they didn't just kick us out like after graduation. We could still use our studio a little bit. So I would go into the studio every day and I would work on these images. And so here is my my boron atom and my carbon atom and my nitrogen atom. And you know I was struggling to figure out how what kind of symbology I would use to to describe these characters. But then this is about the time that Steve Edwards helped get me that job at TBWA. So I went from having time to work on it to not having any time really. And also at about that same time, I realized, and this might seem like a small detail, but uh, I had been drawing all these elements so that they were facing towards the center. And when you add energy to an atom, it actually propels them into the next outermost shell. Oh, which, what were you saying? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> So, so this drawing was wrong, and this drawing would probably be more right. Uh, but I know it, it seems funny, but at the time, it was, this is was devastating for me. Like, I, I, all those drawings that I've been doing were completely the opposite of what they should have been. So you must have needed as up a science expert after this process. Well, you know, this is actually where I started to give up on the project. Like, I, really, in my mind, I was like. I was going to explain all of science and drawings, and I was going to use as little text as possible. And then but eventually I got to a threshold where I'm like, uh, Zach, uh, are you a scientist? Uh, I mean, you've taken like one psychology class. I mean, that, you know, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'll go, maybe I'll get a degree in science. I'm like, you're kidding, right? I mean, you love, I mean, you love art. You're, just, you're not going to put up with that. I mean, you, you love to draw. If you don't get to draw, you'll be cranky all the time. So. Uh, so at about this time, I was like, okay, you know what? I just bit off more than I can chew, and I got to face that, and I got to go on. So, so and then, like I said, I started working in advertising, but I was always thinking, like, what? Hold on. Now, maybe I can't explain all of science and drawings, but I can do something. Like, so I'm asking myself, like, what can you do? Like, you got to, you got to do something with this imagery, but what are you going to do? And don't make it all of science, okay? You got to define something that you're really realistically going to do. I was working those two different jobs. I was working seven days a week for two years. So there was no art making at all, but I thought, you know, I really want to go on this trip. So it's, I'll, I'll give up art for two years. So then I came back from the trip. I got my old job at TBWA back and I started having my weekends again. So uh, I'm like, okay, I'm, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the periodic chart. And, you know, I went from a book where I thought I was going to be explaining everything to just one periodic chart. So I thought, how long could this take? I don't know, maybe two or three days. I, I imagined when I first thought of this idea, you know, I'll just, I'll just do one drawing, I'll put that aside, I'll do the next one, I'll do, put it aside. You know, I didn't, I didn't factor in the, I can't draw these things out of my head, I'm going to have to go to the library. You know, I'm going to have to find, what does Mercury look like exactly? You know, all the research that was going to be involved. So, starting in 1990, this is my very first version of the chart. So that's what it looked like, you know, 23 years ago, and this is what it looks like in its final form. This is 1990, and then I did another one in 1991, and then I did another one in 1992. And what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to nail down the concept. Sometimes I go back and forth. And then another thing I was also trying to do, as you can see, I've taken someone else's periodic chart, I've whited out all the boxes, and I've filled them in with my rough pencil drawings. But eventually, I, I realized, hey, you can't use somebody else's chart. You're going to have to design your own. You know, one, one thing that's always thrown me off about the chart is, like, this is the first element, and the second element's way over here. And I thought, that, that's crazy, you know, they should be right next to each other. So I, I worked on this design so that the two elements could be right next to each other. And I, I played with the idea of having it in this vertical format instead of the horizontal format. You know, I, I worked on that design and then I thought, you know what, the problem here is you don't know which orbital you're in. So then I put the, Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted the chart to work like this. 
I also wanted each individual piece of art to work completely on its own. So I wanted to come up with a system. If I just showed you any particular element, you would know where on the chart it belonged, roughly. So I worked out this color scheme where the lighter elements are on the left, and then you slowly transition to gray, and then to darker gray, and then all the way over to black with the noble gases. So eventually you okay. figured out that they're arranged that way for a reason, though, right? Isn't it? You bring up a good point. I was trying to incorporate the, the, the diagrams of the electron shells with the illustrations, and I realized it's just too much information. You've got to kind of pick and choose. So I realized, you know what, this isn't one project, it's two projects. And then it became what I call the diagram periodic chart and the cartoon periodic chart. So I worked on uh, the diagram one, and I kind of like this design, you know, with using color to show which shells have openings and which ones are already occupied. Zach, can I ask yeah. a question here? Sure, sure. Where were you going with this? Were you trying to do something specifically engaging for kids and adults? Right. That Nordic. And artists, I mean, that they could learn something and at the same time be entertained by it? Uh, partially that. Also, I just felt compelled to do it. I mean, I didn't analyze I get, it too much. Yeah. yeah, I get that. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I, I mean, I thought, what can be the downside of this? I mean, meaning no. a yeah. it would help people learn. Right. And, uh, you know, I thought it was a worthwhile e exploration of different sure. uh, ideas. A, a lot of times I would see this not just as a chart, but as an animation, too. So I... I <laughs> And then I would think, you know, I was still struggling with maybe incorporating the illustrations in with the diagrams, even though eventually I decided to drop that idea. So then I thought, hey, this could be a book. And then... This is yeah. an app. This is an app. Yeah. Having yeah. a touch on these things in one of your other diagrams. It is on my YouTube channel. I have a, a small sample where if you click on the element, it'll say its own name. And I think, like, the, the, some, the pronunciation of some of these elements is just mind-boggling. Yeah, uh, old. Yeah, that's a great one. So, I started to work out the, the different characters, and I, you know, started with the first 18. And then I thought, okay, you've got 18, that's good, that's progress. So we've gone from 1990, this is probably about 94, somewhere in there. Uh, and then I thought, okay, you got to do the whole chart. So I, I laid out my own chart, not, you know, not taking someone else's chart and whiting it out, you know, starting with my own design. And I slowly uh, started to fill in the characters. Now, uh, very rarely would I sit down and just draw something that I liked. These were three of the elements. First thought, I thought, okay, it could be like a knight in shining armor, he's being dubbed the knight. And I thought, well, it could be a tape machine that's dubbing from one reel to the other. It, it could be like Robo Dub Dub, three men in a tub. It's a <laughs> Robo Duck. I thought, well, it could be Abner Doubleday as a like a two-headed monster, <laughs> or it could just be the two-headed monster. So uh, the, these were the you know the concepts I worked through before I got to the one on the far right, and, and the same with Indium. You know, at first I thought it'll be an Indian snake charmer guy in East India, and then I thought, oh, it'll be an Indy racer, and then I finally went with the Indian chief. Or for lithium, I thought it could be a light bulb, or it could be a, a vial full of pills, or it could be a battery. So those are some of the concepts that I worked through before I even got to the illustrations. Going back to the diagram chart, this is, I think, the final one where it has the atomic weight and the atomic symbol and the atomic uh, number. So all the information's in there. This is a, a version. I thought I would carry all that information over into the cartoon periodic chart, but I wasn't sure if I would have to pay a royalty to someone for using the atomic weights. So I just decided to leave that out. So when I would get to the final concept, I made a couple quick time movies here, and I thought I would just show you all the drawings I went through to get to the final drawing. This is what, and the element called a Mauricium, and I thought I'd start out with the American Eagle. And then I thought, no, I think George Washington would be better. And then I thought, no, let's do the American flag. So these are all the drawings I did before I got to the one that I liked. And, and I've, got, I, I've got just a couple of these. So here's the one for cesium. So I thought I'd, I'd start out with Julius Caesar holding a Caesar salad. <laughs> And then eventually I realized, what I, I decided what I wanted to do was just do faces and not do bodies. So some of the early drawings include bodies or extra props or stuff. And then I eventually jettisoned that idea and just started, thought that I'd go with uh, just a close-up on the face. Man, a lot of Caesar. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, I, a lot of, I'm not kidding, Bob. A lot of times I wish I had your drawing talent when I was trying to do this. Uh, starting, you know, that first chart I showed you was 1990, and I just finished it last year. So that's... 
22 years. It's a 22 year time frame. Each drawing probably took a day. For 118 drawings that I liked, I had to do almost 4,000 drawings. So I, had, I have almost 4,000 drawings uh, to get to the 118 that are actually on that chart. Did you keep all of your sketches? You know what, I actually did, and I, what I wish I had done is dated all the sketches, because I don't have any dates on any of them. But I did keep them all. Because I, I was hoping someday maybe I'd be able to show an animation like this. Just and these are all, all this? This is Rubidium. But they were all done with ink? Well, some of them are pencil and some of them are ink. So that, but that's a good question. So I would, I would do it in pencil first. And I uh, used the cheapest paper I could find, which is newsprint. And I, and I like that. Uh, and then I, if, I, if I thought it was halfway decent, I would ink it. But here's one thing I totally didn't bargain for, and that is even if I had a drawing that I really liked and that I thought looked good, it still might not work because it might not be compatible with the other elements in the chart. And uh, to me, I, that was just something I didn't expect. I thought, hey, you do a good drawing, you put it in the chart, bingo, you're done. I, I started to think about the chart as like a big building with tenants in it. And all, all the people who lived in the building had to get along with each other or someone had to get kicked out. No, I, it's a question. I think I remember reading like three weeks ago they discovered a new element. Yeah. I want to throw you in the <laughs> yeah. I am ready for your question. I am ready for your question. But seeing as all the people in the apartment complex have to work together. Uh, well, hold on. I'm not going to talk about that. So, okay. so here's the, the version of the final chart, you know, with all the elements and with the text up at the top explaining it. And then you're right. After they manufacture these elements, it's about a 15-year process before they can get the name authorized. I mean, you can't just say, hey, you know, it's Zaxitium. That's what it's going to be. You, know? you, you can't do that. So, uh, so even after they discover the new element or they manufacture it, they still have to wait for the official names to come out. However, just recently, two new official names have come out. So there's now going to be uh, Fleurobium and Livermorium. Those are the two, two new elements. <laughs> So when it's, you know, I'm I'm ready for that. I'm ready for that. I've, I've been working on that. A lot of ones like it is insanely rare. I mean, well, these, all the new ones are because they have to be manufactured. I eventually made a website out of that moving chart, and uh, it's called uh, electronwatch.com. The thing that I'm most proud of about electronwatch.com is that I I made an animated movie out of the chart. You can either go to my YouTube channel or you can go to electronwatch.com. And you can, I think this is the first animation of the chart that I've ever seen, which allows you to see its position on the chart on the right and the a kind of a cartoon like simplification of what goes on inside the electron shells on the left. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I, I decided you could only do so much with, with one thing. So I've got the diagram chart, this is, this is that, and then I've got the uh, cartoon chart too. And so I'll just quickly go through these pages. So this is what the website, it's not a beautiful piece of design, but I just wanted to get that animation published somewhere. And so that's what the chart looks like uh, on the web. I do have the cartoon periodic chart copyrighted. What has been your response from, or is it too soon to tell? I mean, has anyone contacted you and said, what the? I consider myself an artist, but I, I don't consider myself a business person. However, my sister and her husband are business people. so. They said, hey, if you want, we'll turn this into a business for you. So they've created a company called CocoBee.com, and they've set up the website. They've got it onto Amazon and eBay, and they've got their own store on CocoBee, and they're you know, always working to get publicity for it. They're the ones who are actually doing all the printing and the shipping of it. So, um, How much is it? Uh, it's $30 for a 2 by 3 foot, and it's uh, $20 for a 1 by 2 foot version. It's real heavy too. Yeah, I mean it's on good stock. You can you can go up to the front of the room and see it. And then my sister wanted to do like a, a condensed version of it, like the version from 12 or 15 years ago. It's just the first 18 for maybe a younger audience. So that's also available. And she's printing them up on T-shirts. Who's that? Uh, it did win some awards from a magazine called Creative Child Magazine. Okay, so uh, that's, that's basically uh, everything I had to say. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions. I think it's a thing of great beauty. <laughs> Thank you. you. Yes. Yes.